Welcome to the Black Writers Studio, a podcast presented by the Hurston Wright Foundation and hosted by Dr. Khadija Ali Coleman. The Black Writers Studio is dedicated to showcasing Black writers who are transforming the world today with their literary pen and creating a legacy for the culture. Tara Betts is the author of Break the Habit, Ark and Hugh, and the forthcoming Refuse to Disappear. In addition to working as an editor, a teaching artist, and a mentor for other writers, she has taught at several universities. She was the inaugural poet for the People Practitioner Fellow at the University of Chicago and founder of the nonprofit Whirlwind Learning Center. Her poetry has appeared in numerous anthologies and journals, including the Breakbeat Poets, Poetry Magazine, and Essence Magazine, which named her as one of their 40 favorite poets in 2010. Tell me this, you have so many um, hats. You are a university professor, I would consider you a social activist of sorts, particularly because of the content of a lot of your work. You are um, an arts writer, meaning that you review the work of other writers. Um, You also are um, a a, a teacher in the sense of not just a university professor, but you have done everything you've worked with Hurston Wright. Um, foundation as a mentor and instructor during our summer writing workshops. Um, I know that you even um, started a nonprofit. Am I right? Yeah, it's in the fledgling stage. So okay, do not diminish that because that's major. And so um, with all these hats, um, I'm going and, and you start your nonprofit. Let me use some nonprofit language. You talk about the mission statement, mission driven nonprofits, right? What is your mission statement? as a writer, if there was a statement or a phrase or just some words to really um, contain what the point of it all is when you write, what, how would you explain that? How would you describe that? Well, for me, I know I started writing when I was very young, you know, I was a teenager and a college student and I just felt like it helped me make more sense of the world. And it was kind of therapeutic and cathartic in some ways because I could sit down, write something and I felt different, right? Mm -hmm. And the more conscious I became as a reader, the more I felt like I didn't see stories that looked like my family, that looked like people I knew. And when I did, I would just like, just latch on and grab in. Like I remember reading Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cagebird Sings when I was 13. And my mother, she didn't realize I was doing this. And I I may talk about this later, but she had books laying around like the Alice Walker short story collections, like You Can't Keep a Good Woman Down. And I can't remember the name of the other one. Yeah, she wasn't planning on you reading that. (laughs) She wasn't. But and I told her when I was grown, like years and years later, I said, Mom, I said, you had all these books laying around and they had black characters in them. So when you weren't looking, I read them. And she says, you did? You weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> I guess she figured, you know, if you're a kid, you're not going to read it. So I remember reading that. I remember reading Raymond Andrews, who a lot of people don't talk about his novels. Um, his brother, Benny. Yeah, because I'm, I'm ignorant of Raymond Andrews. Phil, tell us who that is. He was a novelist who wrote a lot about Black folks in the South, Black folks, you know, kind of in the juke joint era or like kind of in rural situations. But he wrote like four or five novels and a memoir. And one of the last gifts my mother got me was the memoir. She found a a signed copy online. Wow, When, when was he, when was his writing journey? Like what years? I think it might have been like the 80s, maybe. Okay, okay. There's a lot of Black writers from the 80s. Like I think of Gene Austin and and a couple other people. Like Gene Austin was a contemporary of Terry McMillan. So people, she only wrote one book. Oh, wow. People don't talk about her that much. But 
it was on a major press. I think it was on Plume or something. Was she one of your the read, the writers that you read when you were little, or did you get to her when you got older? Well, Raymond Andrews and Alice Walker, I got to when I was young. Mm-hmm. There's other people like Gene Austin, I got to when I was older. You know, mm-hmm. so it's so interesting because I think you and I are contemporaries in age. I may be a little bit older, um, but if that's the if you're talking about starting to read. Um, Alice Walker in the 80s, that was a, around the time when she was controversial, so to speak, within yeah, our community re- regarding a, her content, you know, is really divisive and so interesting that Marita Golden, the um, the co-founder of, of Hearst and Wright um, Foundation talks about that this organization was really founded and, and even thought of was founded with those types of controversies in mind where um, within our community, some of the literature looking, just the showing the diversity and thought in terms of what we are allowed to write about, what we should be writing about, going back as far as that conflict between Zora Neale Hurston and Richard Wright. So as you, as this 13 year old reading all of these things that you're not supposed to, your mama didn't know about, how did this kind of form this this mission or this writerly life? Well, it kind of, it let me know that there aren't, I mean, at least at the time, I felt like there weren't a lot of books that told the stories I wanted to see, mm-hmm. or I wasn't being taught those stories. Mm-hmm. And particularly when I was reading my Angelou, I remember feeling like, I don't know this person like that. Like, I don't know her personally. She doesn't live by me. We don't talk to each other, but this book is speaking to me. And I said, what if I wrote something that people felt like spoke to them? And I remember asking that question as a young person, right? And I think that was what kind of, I knew I wasn't, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, I'm gonna write this poem and this is great. But you kind of know, you're like, it's First of all, can fair. I just say I love that voice? <laughs> <laughs> love it. Oh, right, right. Okay. You're just writing and you're not aware of, you know, whether it sucks. It's just so empowering to, to you're crafting, you're creating, you're doing this. Right. Yeah. And then as I got older and I got more involved um, with understanding history, understanding politics and moved, you know, to Chicago which is a very segregated, very political city on so many fronts. Um, Went to college, I went to Jesuit University, I went to Loyola and very conservative in some ways, but then also really liberal in others, you know. Which one, the one in Baltimore? uh, The one that's here in Chicago. Okay, okay. The one in Loyola Marymount and then the one here. Okay, okay. So when I went there, that was kind of where my political engagement took off on a whole other level. Cause I was very involved in the black community where I grew up in Kankakee, you know, but you know, it wasn't the same when, as when you go to an environment like a major American city. And at the time Loyola is situated in Rogers park, which at the time was considered the most diverse neighborhood in the country. What? Really? In the country? In the country. Like sociologists would come there specifically to study Rogers Park. So I I lived there. I went to school there even after I graduated for a couple of years. And it was really like, it's still kind of a little sleepy neighborhood in some ways. They've done some development there. So there's more buildings that are high rises. Mm -hmm. But the building I used to live in is still there. And it, it was like you had Asian people, African folks from different areas of the continent. You had white people, you had college students, you had older people, you, had, oh, wow. you know, like it was a really nice mix of- So folks. you're not even talking about just racially diverse. You're talking about the whole gamut from socioeconomic to just every imaginable demographic you can imagine. Right. And it was, it was an education just to yeah. live in a community with all these different folks, you know. So, so, so when we even talk about a mission statement, it's, um, it, it sounds like your 
writing was just really reflective of this human journey you were on that um, it really has, and it continues to emerge um, as this um, voicing your experiences, your observations. My mm -hmm. question is, um, has it always been centered through poetry or well, all, have other genres kind, kind of made their way into your practice, although poetry seems to be at the forefront? Poetry is definitely at the forefront. I thought, I remember at one point early on before I published my first book, I thought poetry is probably, even though the least paid <laughs> of all <laughs> genres, let's just be clear on that. Um, and probably the most competitive, weirdly enough, yeah. Um, Cause there's so many new poets and if, you know, every time and it's like, you gotta time things just right. And I'm never great at that, but however, <laughs> um, in terms of collaborating with creative people, it's length, it's brevity. Um, sometimes the sonic qualities of a poem, mm. I think it's great to think about how can you employ it in other mediums. Like think about all the people now who are on YouTube doing poems and they right. built their whole careers doing that or doing right. poems on Instagram. I believe, isn't that how Rupi Cower got started? Mm -hmm. And, and you know? we, we won't even get into the controversy surrounding her work um, yeah, we because, but it's, it, <laughs> but, it, but it speaks to even this read, redefining of what poetry is you know moving from this really um i'm not going to even i don't even think elite is an accurate word but there you know there's certain rules cer certain conventions and now you know i think that it has become the approach is as diverse as the the people now who engage in this 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 um type of this format of writing do you what, what are your thoughts on that what you know as someone who is a university professor who teaches creative writing who is a poet who um reviews the work of other other folks do you what are your thoughts on this you know this broadening of the genre to to be redefined i know that mm -hmm. in the, within the month i've seen on twitter folks talking about their new um poetic form that they created <laughs> yeah and it's like yeah. wow that's empowering but is it, it is. is it a new creation if you're the only one um utilizing it like how does that work what are your thoughts on that well I think you know because I came up with a form too over the pandemic but mm -hmm. we can talk about that a little bit <laughs> um, as far as this blossoming of all these different types of poets and, you know, the aesthetics and their experiences and, you know, who are their influences. I'm excited about that because it looks more like what I thought poetry should look like, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's always these scholars who have these debates about is poetry dead and I said, that's really interesting to me that it all of a sudden you want to kill off poetry mm -hmm. when it looks like there's more black and brown people in it. Right. When, when there's it becomes more accessible. Queer. Right. When it becomes mm -hmm. something where queer and working class people want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like all these people you didn't invite to the party. Now you right. don't you want to shut the door. Right. So, right. That, I, that That's why I grapple sometimes with the um, the word elite, because when you mm -hmm. even use that word, a lot of times you're thinking of something that's higher art or something that is, I guess, to be honest, something better, but, but just because something is not accessible or that there are certain rules that are put in place to, to make it so that you're differentiating between um, this, the, the art that this group creates and the art that this group creates doesn't mean that it's elite in the sense that it's better. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I like how you, you speak to that because it's true. We're seeing a lot more um, people using poetry really as a, a form of um, 
social activism, you know, giving voice to things that haven't been voiced before. Um, mm. You know, what, what would you say have been the biggest inspirations, whether it's a person, whether it's an experience, a place that has influenced your work and inspired your work? Well, I mean, definitely my time in Chicago, my time on the East Coast, just in terms of meeting other writers and being exposed to other people I wanted to read. Um, I know early on in my in my poetry writing life, Pablo Neruda was a big influence, mm -hmm. Audre Lorde, Sonia Sanchez, Anne Sexton. Uh, Instructor-wise, I would probably say Lucille Clifton and Alpha Michael Weaver, you know, who is it's often I have nicknames for each other and I've met members of his family who are just mm -hmm. wonderful people holding down Baltimore mm -hmm. and, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's been a journey, you know, like you just keep, I think if you keep writing and you keep engaging people in the literary world, you just meet more people in your circle gets wider, mm -hmm. you know, um, I know for sure, you know, I, I stay in touch with Damaris Hill a lot. Mm -hmm. I stay in touch with some of my students from um, the watering hole because I taught there twice. Okay. You know, so you end up kind of ping-ponging around mm -hmm. and talking to a lot of people like it's another family. Mm -hmm. I don't think um, that folks realize how... Um, it, it, these some of these relationships that poets, um, that writers, these spaces that they meet, folk. I don't think folks realize that a lot of times these meetings became become lifelong associations, and how many of you, um, it seems, tend to um, organically bring attention to issues at the same time through your writing, sometimes without even intent, but just being empathetic or being open to what it is that you observe each other doing. Um, mm -hmm. I think of um, Black Writers Speak Out. I think that's what it was called um, in 2014, around the time when we had a lot of um, pol police brutality being magnified in the media. Um, and a lot of folks believe in that that was when a lot of it began. <laughs> <laughs> and not so much that that was really when a lot of attention through um, Trayvon Martin's um, case, um, just a lot of attention was brought to things. But I, I know that if we're looking recently, that those kinds of things have been springboards for poets really being front and center. I think of, um, you know, the recent COVID, then coupled with George Floyd's um, murder, um, really being these spaces where poets are, are bringing the humanity to the space um, through their words. Are you, um, can you look at any particular period in history since you've been alive where um, a moment may have been so touching or searing that you just had to write about it? Like there was no question. And um, that it really introduced you to a part of your your writing voice that you probably hadn't been introduced to before. Gosh. Um, I feel like there's always moments and I can, I don't always think about big historic events either. Right, right. Um, I had a poem that I wrote that's in this anthology called Where We Stand. Um, which Truth Thomas and Enzo oh. Sturin and um, Mo gosh, now I'm, I'm Melanie Henderson. Yes, I'm like <laughs> I just went blank, and I love Melanie to pieces. Right. But I couldn't believe I forgot her name. Sorry, mm -hmm. Melanie. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. So I had this poem in there called "Stay Lit," and in the poem, it's not really about when they had all those race riots in Charlottesville. It's not at all, but it was sparked by that. So there's like one little mention of it. And then I go into this whole process of making a salad because it's really talking about how can I stay healthy 
and promote having my long life so I can outlive someone who thinks this way. And that's really the crux of the poem. Mm. Cause it's like the events aren't always what matters. It's how they have a ripple effect on our mm. lives and the people that we know, right? That's really deep. So you're even talking about how it impacts us, just our wellness, um, mm-hmm. seeing these things, being a part of, right. of the activism against these things and how it's really killing us in more ways than we are just seeing when we, we see direct uh, aggression. Um, exactly. Yeah, that I, I think... I feel like you're the second person to bring up that anthology during the interview. Um, And I know so many great writers who are included in that that anthology. So um, we have to include the details at the end when you give us um, heads up about your forthcoming book. And so that's what I'd like for you to just talk talk a little bit about. Um, You have several publications out, you're a prolific writer. Tell us a little bit about this forthcoming book that's coming out in June. So my latest book, Refuse to Disappear, will be out on WordWorks Books, like you said, later in June. And it's basically poems that are looking at the voices of Black women. So there's some women in particular that I celebrate in the book, like uh, Simone Biles and Lieutenant Yuhua, aka Nichelle Nichols. Um, <laughs> not the new one, even though I'm excited there's a new Lieutenant Yuhua, but this one's specifically to the first. <laughs> you know, so there's a couple of poems like that that are kind of in the manuscript and strategically placed. And then I really wanted to think about who are the voices that I want to stick around, that I don't want to be left behind, that I don't want to be omitted from the story. Mm. And I kind of got the title from um, a line or a, it was a snippet from something I read by Eric Priestley, the mm. LA writer who was part of the Watts Writers Workshops who recently passed. And we used to talk a lot on Facebook and he would send me little emails and you know, he just had this really unique turn of like West Coast slang. So he would send me notes and it would just crack me up, <laughs> you know? And I was like, but he told me all these wonderful stories about like growing up in the South. And then when he went West and, you know, he, you know, was just really kind and generous. I think he was, sometimes I think when older people know they want to share these stories before they get lost, they just talk to you. Mm-hmm. so he would you know share that stuff with me and I said I'm gonna write this poem because there was um there's a reader series in Lamert Park called Voices of Lamert Park mm. and I featured there once years ago so they did a book and they asked me to write something for the book and I ended up writing this poem kind of inspired by Eric so I said okay this is the anchor for the book like I knew I wanted that to be the anchor of this next, this book that's coming out because that's kind of what we're talking about. It's like, how, how do we overcome these obstacles and these barriers that make us seem invisible, even though we are indeed here? Mm-hmm. How are we always, you know, and not even always trying to deal with them. It's like, maybe sometimes you're standing on top of them you know, or something like you have to find some kind of physical position Mm -hmm. to dodge it or look over it to see something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and it's, it's interesting because through the, the, these conversations, like what you had with him and then you document your experience through your voice, what you're doing is extending the life of this memory and you're you're documenting it so it doesn't get lost. So you're, you know, a, a cultural, not just a cultural curator, but an archivist in a sense, um, because a lot of the things that we don't know um, have to do with these stories being lost, these happenings going out to the ether and, and purposefully not being um, passed down or shared. Um, do you think that um, for someone who, um, isn't familiar 
with your past work. Is there anything new in this forthcoming volume that um, will, they probably can't, if they were to go back, they wouldn't find, is there anything new that you kind of um, explored or a side of yourself that you um, shared in this forthcoming book that we, we should be on the lookout for? Well, I mean, I haven't had a collection that's been out and it's been almost, has it been seven years? I think it's been seven, eight years since the last book came out. Wow. No, it's been seven. It's okay. Been seven. Okay. But you've had other pieces, just not, oh, in, yeah. just, so, just not, you know, you've been actively writing, but you just haven't had a volume out. I haven't had a volume out. So mm -hmm. I have poems that have come up in several anthologies, a bunch of different journals. Um, I'm getting ready to put out a folio in a, an Illinois based journal here called Spoon River Poetry Review which I'm kind of excited about because I grew up as a, one, when I first started writing poems, one of the first books I loved was Spoon River Anthology. Oh, nice. People don't really teach that anymore. Yeah. You know, but it was one of those books that made me think about how people's stories overlap. Mm -hmm. You know, and that archival impulse is like, I think there's that and I almost did an MS in library science after the PhD because of that I think I was just so wanting to do that I took a couple classes and everything but, <laughs> um the archival impulse and then too like this this ancestral impulse mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and I really believe you know you know we can talk about heaven and hell and all these esoteric things that we have no idea if they really exist right <laughs> but I do believe in my heart of hearts that your ancestors stay alive as long as you keep them alive yes, and you speak true. their names and you tell their stories mm -hmm. so for me that's a huge part of it even though I don't always say that mm -hmm. up front you know you know what? I think what you just did masterfully, whether on purpose or accidental, is that you answered my first question and oh, you came dear. full circle. I love it. I love it. And that's actually something that I, I hope I would like to explore with you further is just that whole ancestral piece in another interview so you have to put me on your calendar um of after course. the book comes out and we get together and it, it might be a group of us or a panel but I definitely want to explore that with you so okay. as as we come to the the close and um just to tell the audience that offline that we talked about how um you you've been on podcasts where you've been they've been hours long I can so understand that <laughs> because <laughs> You have such a laid back conversational way that it's just, you don't realize, oh, we've been talking for quite a while. So I'm going to be the person. You've been great though. Oh, well, I appreciate no. it. I, I enjoy talking to you so much. It's just so chill. And I have so many questions and I know that this would never end unless I, I, I close <laughs> us out. <laughs> so I just want you to um, tell folks where they can pre-order your book. Okay. that you know that is coming after six after your last book six years after the last book where they can pre-order it and what I always ask writers to do is to um, direct folks to the booksellers that you want them to buy it from so if people want to get the book you can go to pre-order at wordworksbooks.com and it's up now you can click and get it and it should be on SPD booksellers. And I'm not sure when it will be live on Amazon, but it probably won't be live there first. Okay. Um, I hope it will be on Bookshop. That would be my choice. So okay. I have to check and see, but I'm pretty sure it'll be in the major venues where people can click and buy it. Okay, um, awesome. Any, yeah. um, any other, um, 
news you want to share with folks before we um, we close out? Anything you want folks to know? Um, tell us the name of that anthology again, where you were recently, because I, I think that anthology came out maybe a month or two ago. Um, yeah. From Truth it's Thomas called, and what is that? Cherry Hill Publishing? Cherry Castle Publishing. Cherry Castle Pub yep. Publishing. Independent <laughs> Black Press. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I've known Truth Thomas since we were both in an MFA program together, and he's just been publishing wonderful things aside from where we stand for a long time now. So where we stand, it's Poems of Black Resilience on Cherry Castle Publishing. Okay, and folks can Google that to get more information. It's, it's funny because Truth is another person that's come up in other people's interviews. I, I, um, I know I interviewed Alan King some months ago, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, he's part of that group of poets um, where um that were under the tutelage of Tony Medina. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so a lot of you really um, have these these interactions with each other that just emerge into these wonderful stories. And I love it. I love it. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Betts, for being with us in this edition of the Black Writers Studio. And I look forward to, uh, to you joining us again. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Khadija. Take care. Thank you.